Hey y'all, blessings and welcome. I'm Elsa, I'm the main narrator of this space, um, Hellenistic Astrology Channel here on YouTube. I'm joined today with two brilliant astrologers and study buddies and colleagues. First, David Fisher from In First Place on YouTube. And I, we'll put our like or our links and all of our descriptions and how you can get a hold of us and what we do at the end of the video. So don't worry about that. So we've got David Fisher. Hey, David, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for inviting me. And, yeah, and KD, another brilliant astrologer from the East Coast, USA. She's got a um, website with her tarot. And do you do reading still with tarot? Yes, well? yeah, tarot. Okay. Well. Cool. So thanks, Katie. Thanks for being here. Thanks. So happy birthday, Aries. Happy Aries ingress to everyone. Just ignore the Aries ingress chart for this year and we can just all be happy. Yes. All right. So um, welcome then everyone to our 36 part series on the Deccans. Our intention with the series is to pay like a homage, like a a ritualistic participatory group activity. So definitely engage with us. Um, this activity is just to kind of share with you our journey going through the Deccan. So we're not coming here as like foremost experts or anything. We're just inviting you to come along on this little vlog of the Deccans. It's been a long time coming and we are really happy to be here. So um, join us. Um, each new drop, participate in this live ritual study of the faces of the zodiac. Yeah, and if you like the information that we bring, make sure to subscribe to Elsa's channel, Hellenistic Astrology, and to like this video, set the bell button so you can get the notifications when the videos come out every decade. So the faces of the zodiac, here we are. So in this series, we'll be referring to a lot of the heavy hitters in the space, um, just to invoke their wisdom and their blessing as we go. So we'll be following this arc of um, Austin Kovic's 36 Faces, Susan T. Chang's uh, 36 Secrets, and then we'll be using things like the Picatrix and other authors, other, you know, what, Antigas of Athens, um, Rhetorius, just different things that we are naturally kind of looking at to study the Deccans as we go. So that's kind of the general scaffolding for the discussions. We'll be using those. Um, and we hope that the imagery that is brought up with these decans also help you uh, see how the sun going through each one of them might be manifesting those particular forms that we are going to be talking about in your uh, life or around you or in the world in general for you to notice and get to learn. Absolutely. So um, I don't know, this is cheesy, but this is a thing that I want to do. So we'll see how this goes throughout the series. But if you are here and you're watching, whenever you're here, whenever you're watching it, drop a little ax in the comments below <laughs> because this deck in Aries one, sun ingress into Aries one is a double Mars ruled uh, deck in and throughout the sources, it's an ax or like a double headed ax. Like I kind of wanted to put our faces in like holding an ax. <laughs> you'll see it on the thumbnail, I do this little you know, magical thumbnails with some of the um, imagery and coloring and things like that that we see in the first uh, Deccan of Aries. So if you're here, drop an ax below, let us know you're with us and watching. And any comments, you know, if we get something wrong or if you want to just comment to participate in things that have been happening in your life during the Deccan, things that you're noticing happening. Like today I woke up with a headache, which is like a common symptom of like Aries head and like a Martian kind of headache vibe. So it's like, just let us know even the most mundane things because it's fun to study and hear from everyone. Cool, so I think I'm gonna start by reading a little bit from Demetra George's ancient astrology book, kind of like one of the two Bibles of the Hellenistic astrology. And I'm Temporary gonna, library, yeah. Yeah, exactly. In every library, we are joined by a few sunstones, so we're just getting the vibe right. And I'm just, just to get the ball rolling, I'll read a few things and you guys uh, feel free to comment as we go. The Greek word prosopon, used in the discussion of the decans, means face or mask. The 36 decan stars as deities were thought to shine through their portions in the zodiacal signs. They shaped faces, they shaped the faces of the seven stars or planets. In turn, that planet had a sympathy with its Decanic god. Uh, Paul of Alexandria or Paulus Alexandrinus and Firmicus Maternus both related the teaching that a planet in its own Decan, even if it's in the domicile of another star, 
rejoices and performs in the same way as it would in its own domicile sign. So just keep in mind, you know, if you have planets or birth dates that have like a, you know, that double decanic thing, it gives them a really strong domicile, which I thought was interesting, right? Like we don't necessarily think of them as being that important. So do you guys have comments on that? That it, a, a star in its decanic face would act as though it's in its own domicile. Yeah. Yeah, I find that really interesting and um, makes perfect sense to me. And just to clarify, when you talk about this being a double Mars decan, you're talking about Aries, the sign being ruled by the planet Mars. And then this specific decan is also ruled by Mars. <laughs> so it's just a whole lot of Mars. Yeah, completely. And it's based off, I guess we could say, I mean, we said this one, it wasn't going to be like a teaching moment, but each decan, and I think, you know, we're going to get to that. I'm sure Demetra talks about it, but each de each sign is broken up into three 10 degree allotments or apportionments. And each one of those three has its own special ruler. So all of Aries is ruled by Mars, but then we've got the three different for Aries, for instance, it's first Mars, then it's the sun, and then it's Venus. So you've got three different rulers, sort of sub rulers under the sun, each having 10 degrees. So I believe that when you're talking about a planet being able to manifest its true nature, like when it's in its domicile with the appropriate tools, uh, then the Deccan also makes sense. This comparison to the Deccan, uh, from the Deccan to the domicile uh, makes sense uh, because the planet in its own Deccan will use the signs, um, um, objects, people, uh, archetypes to manifest uh, stuff in the world according to that planet, the domicile planet, um, planet's nature. But on the faces, they will also put up a, a front of that particular decanic ruler while doing that as well. So there are things that are kind of Martian and solar at the same time of, for the decan of the sun or that are Martian um, in the realm of the domicile, but are also more Martian in the level of the face, which is kind of a, like a mask that the planet would have to wear. So it, it, different levels of reality that indicate that that planet has a way of manifesting its own energy that is appropriate for it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why sometimes they'll talk about it, it, that it being the image that shows itself because Venus is forced to work under Mars. So it has to be Venusian things that sort of serve the bigger energy of Mars, right? So that would be the third decan I'm referring to. So you know, for instance, you could say, how does Venus, you know, take the face of Mars or serve Mars? Well, I can think of a nurturing Venusian uh, Mars-like thing, which is cooking, right? Mm -hmm. So that might be a way that you see that show up. So just taking into account that there's sort of those layers, which with Aries 1, we see really strong because it's Mars and Mars. So Mars just says, go. And Mars is like, okay, it doesn't have to answer to anyone else. So I think when you have those sort of uh, likenesses, you're going to have a certain amount of flow, for better or worse, of the the non-restricted nature of that planet. So we see that right off the bat, especially with this um, first decan of Aries, double Mars. Um, and we actually end the entire decan with a Mars ruled sign again. So it's two Mars ruled decans back to back. And that has to do with just the Chaldean order of how we go around um, the signs. The primary use of the decans in Hellenistic astrology was to describe the bodily ailments and fates of individuals, hearkening back to their role in ancient astral Egyptian religion. The guidelines for the practical usage of the decans are outlined in a few authors that Dimitri gives us. So we've got um, the decans outlined in Porphyry's introduction, Vitorius's compendium to serve sort of Babylon, um, Paulus in the introduction, uh, Hephaestio and Apotelsmatics, and on from there. So if you want to read in Demetrius' book, it's um, 224, and it's just that first kind of like introduction to um, interpreting the decans. And those are some of the source texts that you're going to find for the actual interpretation of the decans. We are 
you know, we'll get into interpretation here and we might get into the astrology of it because we can't not because we can't help ourselves. But <laughs> here we're just kind of toying around with the images. And that's what you're going to see in a lot of the stuff, especially the further along you go. You're looking at these images from like Yavana Jataka, the Picatrix. Like it takes that face, that image. Do you guys want to say anything about taking the, the image? Well, we will be. We'll be talking a lot about the image. Um, I mean, especially in the tarot, as we're, we're going to get to. But um, all these things, you know, these images um, as, as symbols really give the meaning, the nuanced meaning of each Deccan. And it's just, it's beautiful having this collection of images. And again, that's why we're so excited to do this Deccan walk. <laughs> yeah, so here we go. Let's jump in. So I am going to start by just um, talking from Austin Kobik's 36 Faces. And he calls this Deccan the axe, because like we talked about, it's mentioned in almost every author. Whereas Susan Chang, Susan T. Chang, she refers to it as, what is it? Seeds of domination. Yeah, the right? Lord of dominion, yeah. yeah. The Lord of dominion, seeds of domination, the axe. You'll see this in some of the imagery that I put in the thumbnail as well. You've got, you know, well, we'll get to that with the red eyes and the mad, <laughs> the mad man. But what I thought was really cool in the faces where Austin talks about the ax as the primordial splitter. This was just like a dope way of putting it as well as super deep way of putting it because I think that process of, you know, splitting the atom or just that kind of spark of something, right? That primordial splitter talking about, he also says something about um, the splitting of one is a severance from the symbolic mother. And it just, you know, and I think he might talk about this a little bit too, but I'm just thinking of that like umbilical cord moment when we become, you know, atoms that are split from the one into individuation and we're forced into that individuation, right? That's not necessarily something we're always choosing, especially on a deep primordial level. level. So I thought that primordial um, acts, the primordial splitter really made sense for this sort of like big bang of the start of the Zodiac or something like this. Yeah, and it does um, recall the idea of a child being born or of a seed uh, sprouting from the earth you have this the same energy being applic uh, applicable here when a, a chick is packing out of its eggshell uh that kind of first split or the umbilical cord once the child is born and all of that is very representative of this first decade is that energy of beginnings that is kind of harsh <laughs> but it's yeah. necessary for life in and its process in the natural world like in gardening when a, a plant breaks through the soil is another you know example of this but what comes right after it breaks through the soil is it has to be hardened the process of hardening plants exposing them to sun wind rain in order to make them thrive later on and that really resonates with this Deccan for me too yeah totally just the like like you were saying two things that came up for me David when you said that was I remember reading in the Picatrix um one of the magical like uh, preparations for this Deccan for doing magical works or something is uh -huh. you're doing something with egg whites. Like you're writing with egg whites and you said that primordial, egg, you know, you said the egg is <laughs> necessary for life, but it can be painful. So that was the one thing is that they're using egg was to whites. make the actual, the paint for the yeah. Deccan, which was red. The, the Yes. Yes. The things to make the paint. That's right. Mm -hmm. And they use the egg white for the, for the writing or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. so I thought that that was really apropos. Yeah. And then, um, what was I going to say about the blood? I don't know. I think I forgot about the blood, maybe just something having to do with childbirth, but yeah, that just really. It is a bloody process. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Sometimes. Blood is at the yeah. beginning and the end. Yeah, exactly. And it's not just this bloody process for like the mother who has to bring into this world something that she has to give of herself, but then be severed from in order for the child to individuate, which is painful in, in so many ways. The, the process of the actual birth, the physical pain, the emotional sort of like having to let this little seedling individuate, but especially for the seedling that's individuating, right? Yes. I mean, that is so like, 
primordially terrifying. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so then he talks after the umbilical cord moment, um, the ax is granting victory in war or domination over one's enemies. And then he goes on to talk about the axe in other ways, um, like the axe that is, I guess you could say a little bit more benefic. So the axe that's sort of like taming one's environment. So, you know, splitting wood, building structures, things like this that also support life at its most basic, you know, just things like that lead to nurturing, I guess, you know, eventually. So that same with like that mother child, the primordial like splitting, it's again talking about, you know, how we have to provide for ourselves in this material world in a way that takes a hard work and a bit of violence, right? To sort of- And, and if you're talking about primar primordial uh, splitting for real, you might as well talk about the Big Bang Theory. I mean, everything split from one thing, from one thing, literally everything. Exactly. So, yeah, the Shiva and it was Shakti. violent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And that kind of like Shiva Shakti thing. I was also thinking about the that primordial Shiva Shakti when I was thinking about like um, Linga Bhairavi or, or Bhairava, a, a form of Shiva that's this fierce and red form of Shiva. Um, so yeah, I was thinking about that earlier. So the so then you have this taming aspect of like quote unquote taming the environment, providing yourself like shelter, having to like cut down trees or like you know cut through brush or anything that you would use sort of these, these tools for, and just thinking about like the sacred acts and the you know like how these tools became symbolic of um, certain tantric sacred symbols, I guess you could say, right? So this sacred symbol of the axe and the vulnerability of the individual because i mean i don't i'm not sure if this is true but that sort of like domination to me somehow comes from the idea that we're so vulnerable right the vulnerability of the individuation that we have to like make these structures and cut these things down and it just sort of leads to like i'm so vulnerable now i have to dominate you or whatever or the rest of the people in my village or whatever it is, you know? So that seeds of domination thing, just that discomfort with that splitting and the vulnerability that that gives just makes me, you know, think that that could lead to these sort of like patriarchal domination forces, which I think we'll get to when we talk about- It would be, it would be a good, yeah. It would be a good representation of a patriarchal force, I think, because you have the, the man, it's, it is a man in all these depictions always, and it is, uh, many of the other Deccans have women uh, as well depicted in them. So it's intentional to gender. It's not just like a, it, so it it is a masculine type of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, They're that careful it chooses to, to dominate and to overexert its power because it's wealth. Uh, I'm gonna get to it you know, later, but yeah. Yeah, we will get to it later, but yes, exactly. They are careful to like, let you know certain genders. And this is like, you know, Mars, Mars, and they're saying like, this is the, you know, masculine dominating force, the Lord of Dominion. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. And it doesn't mean that a, a, a woman can't, um, or a feminine individual can't embody this energy at all. It's just like the energy in itself is what we would call masculine outside from the biological gender spectrum. Right. And, you know, like on the other end, like what we would call the feminine version of Mars is, is the sign Scorpio. And that's a very different energy than Aries and all this Aries we're feeling right now. So maybe you all watching can feel the difference at the time between Aries and Scorpio, but something to think about with this very masculine Deccan. I'm sure we'll end up hearkening back, you know, a few months from now when we're talking about Mars's like domicile, feminine domicile, right? It's got, a, and just think of it. Okay, so Scorpio is in this darkening of the light. It's in fall, like we're moving very swiftly into this winter, this drawing away. Whereas Aries, like, I don't know, at least I don't mean to get too much into this spring fall thing, but I'm in the Northern hemisphere. And for me, like the snow is just starting to melt and it's very much like, we knew we were gonna be doing this Deccan thing too but it just come, come up, it just comes up on you, right? Like we've been saying that we we're gonna do this for months and months and then all of a sudden the day is here, right? It's just like fast and strong and it's just here, spring's here, you know? So that being said, the vulnerability of the individual, it could be this liberating force, right? To sever yourself from the mother and become your one 
you know, self with your own karmas in your own life. So like liberating, like the acts of like cutting away, right? Or this cruel weapon to be used on oneself or others in the world of dominion, let's say. So um, Austin uh, talks, uh, Austin urges us maybe, let's say, um, in his like perfect Austin fashion, he <laughs> warns us to be um, careful with swatting flies with battle axes. So chill out this week, everyone. Get your stuff done. Start your new projects. Don't swat flies with battle axes. It's a potent energy to be messing around with, and you can't use it for every whim, you know, that you have. You have to be very disciplined to use Mars. That's why it's exalted in Capricorn. Yeah, absolutely. Really good point. Okay, so I think, you know, those are my notes that really stuck with me, at least as far as the, the 36 faces. So should we move on to 36 secrets? Katie, yeah. do you want, would you mind like kind of leading us through? Sure, definitely. I'm happy to. Um, so this is the book, uh, 36 Secrets by T. Susan Chang. And um, the, the book basically is a companion guide to a decanic walk like the one we're going to be doing with all of you um, and so each chapter has to do with the Deccan um, and it starts of course with Aries 1 um, and so I'm going to read the very beginning of her chapter here um, noting that the three tarot cards that are associated with Aries 1 are the tower the two of wands and the emperor so in this description, she says, with the two of wands, we begin a new year. The vernal equinox balances the hours of light and darkness equally. From this point forward in the Northern hemisphere, daylight will dominate until the first decan of Libra. From September 21st to March 20th, the night and its lunar sovereign will reign. For now, we are entering the sunlit realm, each of its provinces as direct and straightforward as the day is long. Um, so, and a quick note, uh, as we've kind of referenced, uh, we are using a lot of spring terminology uh, because we are, uh, Elsa and I are in the Northern Hemisphere, Dave is in the Southern Hemisphere, but regardless, the symbolism is the same. And so uh, you can still have these apply no matter where you live. Uh, with that note, then I think that we should talk a little bit about the uh, tarot association with the Deccans. Um, so like I mentioned, three cards for each Deccan. Um, one card is the card of the sign. So the sign that we're in is Aries. And so that would be the emperor. Um, this is the Rider Waite Smith tarot deck. Um, yes. And uh, Elsa also has a copy of that here. And um, so this is probably going to be the easiest one. And David has another version, a different. Yeah, this is the deck. Illuminati deck. Uh, it follows a lot of the lines of the right away classic, um, the right away classic style. You know, it's really interesting to do this practice if you do have more than one deck of comparative tarot, uh, because you see a lot of symbols that are repeated or not. So we're each showing a few decks here. Um, this is the Mother Peace deck that Elsa is holding up the representation of the emperor. Um, you'll notice some similarities. It's more like a Roman warrior there with his bounty. Um, in, <laughs> I have this really cute deck called a cat deck uh, where the emperor is a very floofy, uh, uh, strong looking cat in a cat cone. <laughs> so he doesn't lick his wounds. Um, but so the emperor is a card uh, that is also associated with masculine energy. So that's very interesting from the perspective of how masculine this Deccan is. Um, it can also be used to frequently refer to the patriarchy. Um, you'll note if you're looking at a emperor card that in the background uh, there are a lot of mountains, very high rigid rocky mountains with no greenery on them. So it's a very austere card. It's a very um, um, almost in some ways barren because it's so hot. It's so hot and passionate and fiery. Um, it just perfectly represents Aries. Uh, you'll also note the little ram heads on his throne. So it's pretty, pretty Aries full card. In this, um, in this deck, I, I didn't mean to mention this in the beginning, but now I'm just noticing that um, it is really cool to go through your decks and we will feature decks as we go, our favorites and, you know, some smaller artists and things like that. But it's, it's great to bring out your decks, um, compare notes, and also just like put them in a prominent place while the Deccan is happening. That's what I'm doing, like putting them on the altar, 
like just sharing your mind with them, not necessarily invoking them to come into your life, <laughs> but just kind of like thinking about them and um, enriching yourself with them. And what I find interesting is with the Mother of Peace, these gals are like, I mean, it's an older deck, but they're very, um, I don't want to say just like pagan, but like kind of uh, against the patriarchy, shall we say, like activists, right? And in this one, they have him like sort of languishing back in the purple, right? Like almost naked, he's but just man like- spreading. He's basically he man spreading. Yes, and he's like <laughs> sitting back with this like big feast behind him, just like with this kind of royal attitude of just like, what can I conquer? I have it all already, you know? So I think in this deck specifically, they're kind of, instead of giving him this position of extreme power, they're noting this sort of like white privilege, like kickback aspect of the warrior and his bounty and his you know booty or whatever it is that's so, the other thing I appreciate about that deck it pulls in from multiple different traditions and cultures around the world so we'll probably bring that up a lot <laughs> but yeah absolutely the some of the cards in this deck are just as you all know I'm sure everybody has it but it's just it's so beautiful and just earth centric and element centric I absolutely love mother of these decks <clears throat> Okay. Um, well, so that that's a little bit about um, the Aries card, the Emperor. Um, but before we move on from that, I am going to share my screen just quickly. Um, this is a, an image of four different Emperor decks uh, or four different cards across four different decks. Um, on the far left, we have what you might recognize as the Emperor card from the Rider Waite Smith deck. This is the Dreaming Way deck. This is called the Art Nouveau deck, and this is a deck based off of the artwork of Micah Ulrich on the far right. Um, what I wanted to point out by bringing this up is the presence of the Ankh, this symbol of the, it almost looks like a Venus symbol, interestingly, um, with the circle on top and then the cross underneath. Um, across all these decks, the presence of the Ankh is important, um, and I think it, it says that we should be paying attention to it. The Ankh is a symbol of uh, new life, uh, it can be a symbol of fertility, and it can be a symbol of the beginning of something new, which quite appropriate for any equinox, but particularly the vernal equinox. And it also reminds me of like hearkening back pre sort of like, uh, you know, I guess tarot timing or whatever. So it's kind of got kind of like a, it's hearkening back to sort of that Egyptian Ankh, like sun god vibe. So it's kind of hearkening an older time and older uh, ritualistic time as well. You know, I, I like that they sort of kept that in there as a reoccurring Absolutely. theme. It's a very ancient and uh, revered, obviously, uh, symbol to keep, you know, working with. It's interesting the goat head on the one emperor. Maybe I it's know. supposed to be a ram's head. Maybe it's supposed to be a ram's head, right? Yeah, I, it must be. It must be. I can see a lot of other, you know, Mars, Aries terminology going on in this uh, card. So I definitely think that was what uh, the artist had in mind. Cool. Um, so then we have on from the emperor, we yes. have the other major arcana card. Yes, the tower. The tower is the card that um, represents the planet Mars throughout the deck. Uh, or throughout, yeah, a deck of, of cards. And so we're all holding up our little uh, tower cards here uh, from our respective decks. Um, what deck is that, uh, um, Elsa, that you're holding up? This is the Hermetic deck and I absolutely love it. It's got some of the um, Kabbalistic uh, lettering on it, which I'm not fr real familiar with, but it's also got the astrological symbols in all of them. In this one, obviously you can see the Martian symbol just like at the top, like blasting away. Um, but it, they're super awesome as far as like occult cards. Cause they, you know, they keep the tree of life. They just really do um, a lot of that kind of hermetic symbolism. Um, that works well with, you know, Hellenistic astrology and astrologers in general would probably appreciate this deck. And Katie, can you hold up your right away again? Yeah, uh, sure. The card. Um, here we go. Uh, so you have all these little Hebrew letters around le that look like little fires mm -hmm. uh, popping out of the tower that's been hit. Uh, mm -hmm. That's like a, I think it's the first Hebrew letter and that it means like the beginning of everything it's like the ace energy almost like the the kind of energy that we are talking about in Aries one exactly so these little droplets they represent something as well within the card everything in tarot represents something so yeah I think the oh wait this is the wrong one I have the emperor one but the emperor one is the he symbol 
or the he letter, but I suppose I could look up really quick the actual name of the letter so we can try to do it justice. Let me look, let me see, let's see. And while Elsa's looking that up, I also wanna bring up this pretty cool representation of the card, which I think can give you some keywords for what the tower means. Uh, this is the science deck and each uh, card, both major and minor arcana are represented by a scientific principle or theory um, or an invention of some sort. In this case, the atomic bomb is representative of the tower. Um, so from that, you can get some of the keywords for the tower, which are um, sudden change, uh, dramatic events, revelations. I'd say revelations is a little bit euphemistic sometimes for the tower, because <laughs> a lot of times they're rather chaotic and dramatic revelations. And it can just feel like a time where it's hard to get your footing. And I have been feeling that, you know, just like preparing for this. I mean, obviously we wanted to record like on the day where the sun came in. So we were like not giving ourselves like any wiggle room. Cool. But it did, it does come up on you fast and it makes you feel like you just, you know, you have to start new things, but you might have to tear down new projects to make new things. And it's just hard to find that like homey feeling of just like nesting in whatever tower. It's just kind of like hard to find your... Uh, footing and yet you have to blast ahead here in this decade right so you're like you're moving forward there's no possibility of like the tower being there for you you're just like you know on that sudden ground and you have to work with that sudden ground that's how it feels with the tower for me expect the yeah i love it. one depiction that i love about the tower is harry potter <laughs> <laughs> and the half blood prince you have the um, uh the tower moment where, for those of you who don't want to know spoilers for the Harry Potter series, I'm about to give major spoilers of the sixth book. Spoiler but, alert, pause, yeah. move on, go 10, go 15. Go a few seconds ahead. <laughs> but, uh, when um, Dumbledore is killed, Sibylla Trelawney, the, the tarot reader, the, you know, divination teacher, she was, she had a deck of cards and the scenes uh, before that, in the scenes before that, She's appearing, she appears saying, oh, the lightning struck tower. Uh, and she says calamity hitting and all of that. And what happened was that night, Dumbledore got, Dumbledore got killed in an astronomy tower, uh, and which was the highest tower. He fell from it, much like the tower imagery. And what happened after that was a total change in set because Dumbledore was the king. Just like in these cards, you have the king falling. And so after that, you had a new regimen, you had um, stepping in, you had Harry losing the security, the order kind of scattering and needing to regroup. Uh, so everything in the storyline changes for the tone of the seventh book right after the moment Dumbledore is killed. And they have to regroup and reshape and reorganize and understand everything without that particular head that they had previously. And that's like stepping into a new world almost. Uh, the seventh book is completely different. So it is a tower moment within the whole series. That's really cool that they bring that symbolic nature in. in like yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of symbolism. As, as a Harry Potter fan as well, I remember being like, how can you ever go back now? It's not the same story. And I think that's yes. also the feeling, this like turning point, right? Precisely. I mean, it can be scary too. I think that's something that we need to like not, I guess, skirt around with this double Martian sign because Mars has to do with like your blood pumping, your heart racing, being freaked out, running for dear life, you know, just that like impulse, that natural drive, that natural impulse that you just have to be like, okay, the tower hit, we move on. We don't have that sure footing, that kind of confidence and courage that it takes to move through those times. And it's like, yeah, the blasted tower is what, you know, is what it's called in the, um, you know, hermetic deck, but it's like, they have generally, I mean, not to sugarcoat it, but they have people generally falling from the tower. It's not just like, oh, like you're, I mean, it's it's got violence built in. It's not just like you're gonna have to like reorient. So if you are like freaked out by double Mars, if you are freaked out by the tower, the, by the uh, tower card in the tarot, you know, maybe rightly so in a lot of ways. It doesn't mean if you draw it, something's gonna, like your whole house is gonna collapse like at that moment, but it's got that kind of generated power in it of like fear and destruction. It's like, you know, it's definitely got people falling and everybody being like, oh my God. So uh, I wanted to say though, just uh, to wrap that up with the tower is that um, in the hermetic deck, it's called Lords of the Hosts of the Mighty. Lord of the Hosts of the Mighty. And I did find it's, 
forgive me if I don't pronounce it properly, but it's P-E-H. So I think it's Peth, the letter that might be in David's card. You know, you said the little letters were falling, the Hebrew letters in your image. It might be the letter Peth. Yeah, I don't know enough to say. I don't know, but it just in here it says, right? Yeah. That it's associated with that letter. So I don't know if we have it totally right, but um, you know, it could go on to say that. So if you do have this deck, it does talk about some of it, it talks a lot of actually about the Hebrew symbolism and letters in this deck. Um, again, it's not my forte, it's not my specialty, but it's really uh a good read. It really has a lot of stuff in there, even though it's a little book, you know. So it's you'll find interest in more if you uh, go ahead and check it out, look it up. Definitely. Okay, uh, do we have, we want to do more on the tower or should we hop to the third card? Oh, you maybe have images. Uh, do you have images of these too? I, I do. I have one other one I wanted to share, um, which is uh, actually, I wasn't going to share this. And then when you just brought up um, the uh, king falling, I, I remember in one deck, I have um, this image that I'm going to share. Put it to front. Okay. And both in the right of weight and the um, uh, Illuminati one that I was holding up, like you have uh, the king and queen falling from the top of the tower. Yeah, I know. It's the same in this one, too. It's like in almost all of them, except for the more like mild ones, you have like these lightning striking and people just like, ah, like, and, and it assumes that it's the people that can afford to live in that tower up above the peasants, right? So it's kind of like the fall of the patriarchy in a way, right? Or yes. a little bit, kind yes. of like this fall from fall from grace. Um, in, in well, everything. it is the limits being destroyed. The tower signifies structure, things that grow up, grow with time, and this particular moment of renewal, where things are made anew with um, an explosion or um, how do you say violently? Yes, uh, you could put. Um, that's what you get, like the old structures crumbling at this at the site, at the site, at the appearance yeah. of the other thing. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because it could like force action. It doesn't necessarily have to be violence. It could be, it definitely could be, but even if it's not quote unquote violent, just being forced into action can feel that way sometimes, like a milder version of like being forced to make a choice, being girded or goaded into action, right? It's just such a- Malefic energy of Mars. Exactly. <laughs> no matter how, how well you have your Mars place in your chart, it's always going to be a malefic. There you go. Katie, sorry, uh, go ahead with the tower comments. Uh, yeah, this this is the only one I wanted to share quickly just because um, you mentioned the kings falling out. Um, in this deck, what I find interesting is it is a figure who's masked that's falling down from the tower. And I think that um, I've always taken this subtle nuance to say something about the uh, the purification that can come from the tower. You have to, I mean, when you fall out, uh, if your clothes aren't burned off, <laughs> when you fall out, you're kind of at your most vulnerable. You are, you're falling, you might be in your last moments. Um, and it does force one to kind of strip away things like the masks, things that are more superficial or um, incompatible with the changes to come. It is a transformation for sure, uh, whatever, whenever you pull the tower, um, but maybe it'll be the good kind. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even the good kind comes with pain, the pain of growth. And in that image, I like what you said there, Katie. And in that image, it's really uh, stands out because this figure with the mask is also sort of gently clad in the in the Mars cloth, like they're naked, mostly. And so it harkens back to that vulnerability that we talked about of individuation, right? right. The vulnerability of... Um, you know, losing your material wealth or your material status, having to take the mask off, being again, like kind of like Aries, right? You're just born naked, right? And you're yeah. back into that space of just like- And the rest is drag. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. Two of wands. Two of wands. Um, so this card is called the Lord of Dominion. Um, and it is the card that specifically represents the Deccan. I'm holding the Rider Waite Smith version of the card um, with a figure with two wands um, and he's holding a globe and looking out over an expanse of land. 
This one just has the two sort of burning wands with the skull, the go or the um, ram skulls, Mars glyphs, Aries glyphs everywhere. <laughs> just kind Picture of drummer sticks. Yeah, drumsticks. That's right. Yes, like the battle, you know, the battling, or what is it called, battle rams, or like when yeah. they would like beat the drums of war or something like that, right? Yes. And David, you're beautiful. Let me see your cloaked figure. This is the Illuminati deck of the two of ones. It's kind of the same as the right away in most uh, cards. It's just a different interpretation. And I think what you were saying earlier, Katie, like really strikes me and I'm sure we'll get into this, but you were saying something about you see this figure and you think he's sort of like peaceful or languid looking out. And I definitely feel you said, and it's not the way this card is. And what we're about to maybe break that down a little bit more, but I also feel like, you know, this too, it's not the ace, it's not the primordial power, right? And it's not the king who like has a uh, maturity over his dominion. It's almost like, look what I've acquired and what can I do with it? Like, how can I sort of wield it or something like this, you mm -hmm. know? And it's that choice between how are we gonna use the ax? Are we gonna use it for our own liberation or are we going to use it for like domination, right? So it's kind of like, almost like he's pondering or faced with that choice of if you are, if you look over the spread of, you know, humanity or, or nature, how are we going to like wield that power and kind of that to me is like a little bit of what I see when he's being forced with making the choice right like forced into action the choice between how to use that martial energy you know it's like the beginning of a journey of dominion <laughs> through the suit of, of wands uh, because he still has to consolidate power he still has to like actually do the conquering and those two th are actually keywords that I'd use for this card um, it was actually Chang in her book that reminded me when I first started learning the tarot, um, you know, you really are instructed to look at the scene that's going on in the tarot. And this just looks like a really introspective, kind of cautious, maybe worldly guy. But that's not what this is. He's he's planning out his conquest. He's planning out imperialism, colonization, patriarchy. These are also all terms that are associated with this card um, that you wouldn't get with the serene depiction necessarily in Rider Waite Smith. Exactly, exactly. And, and unfortunately, with the Mars being this malefic, and we know how this works, unfortunately, he doesn't choose the acts of liberation. Yep. You know, unfortunately, he's like, hmm, <laughs> turning the globe. I put that in the thumbnail too with the globes, that kind of like global domination like, <laughs> uh, that kind of sets us up on the path of dominating others. And, you know, uh, Susan Chang talks, Susan T. Chang talks about this as well. Enter the patriarchy. She says yes. like in the second like paragraph and goes on to talk about that a little bit more. So those of you who have the book and are following along, you'll know that that's a, a really. fun section. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's just such a, it's such an interesting card really for, for starting out on, like you said, it's not the primordial force that maybe is echoed across the emperor and to some extent the tower too. It's, it's really the beginning of a plotting, you know, and twos in general have to do with the choice like that, that you mentioned. I really like that between the acts of liberation and the acts of dominion or oppression. <laughs> well, yeah. this is the mm -hmm. choice. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there is a sense of having the larger perspective in all these cards with the glow being held in their hand, not only of the, um, of them having like the understanding of how things work, but they, they act like they do and they, they want to impose their understanding on the rest you know it's uh, this card does that it is that energy of oh i am starting this new thing this new project therefore everything that is not my new project and that i am uh, that i am intimately um connected with is going to fall out of favor and i'm not going to notice it i'm going to get uh, i'm going to get past it i'm going to go over it i'm going to get across it and i'm not going to care i'm going to split from it in a way so with what you guys are saying is exactly that like you have a, that whole masculine energy that wants to dominate everything and gives it and give its own face its own uh power its own appearance to everything so it can hold its itself to power uh, i think i'm gonna i think i'm gonna read a little bit from this paragraph of chang unless you wanted to katie unless no no, no i i'm only gonna read the, the poem otherwise so go ahead okay cool so um 
she calls it, which is why I was just glancing down at this, she calls it the precursor to colonization, right? Which is, you know, he's just seeing the land and the globe, right? Like, oh, like, what shall I take of this land that stretches before me, this beautiful, like, you know, do I take the resources? Maybe, maybe he's thought that far, right? But mostly he just wants to say it's mine. And it doesn't matter if there's animals on that land, if there's people on that land, you know, it's the globe itself, not this sort of like minutia of the interconnectedness. It's this. He's greedy for resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so famous for his headbutting. I think she's talking here just about this um, Ram's diurnal sign, Aries, um, famous for his headbutting macho conflicts with other with others over territory and mating rights, which is also another thing. It's not just like blood, lust, fear, but it's also kind of this um, hierarchy of, of, of mating in nature and in humans as well. So it's kind of got that martial masculine like mating rights vibe which is we know how much violence can come out of that and entitlement that. right exactly yeah. exactly and just like the taking the taking right so um <clears throat> this card is fueling um oh wait the energy uh fueling this card is rutting dominating uh spoiling for a fight i like how she puts that right just kind of like gearing up for this fight but the fact that she's a spoiling i really like um I circled headaches here because she know she said it can have headaches and I was like oh my god I woke up with one I, I'm fine now and everything so chill but um primarily with subjugating the other to his own domination literally making the other his subject in this image the man is holding the globe in his hand and we see the precursor to colonization yep she sums it up yep, yep. it's amazing um, yeah, and then she says uh, in in the Latin edition of the Picatrix, uh, she she writes it in Latin, which I don't speak. Um, which she says it's like bold, strong, tall, and shameless, ready for sex or battle. Mm. And she talks about the soil and the seed, like what you were talking about, Katie, um, about also just that primordial thing where the sperm must break the ovum for new life to take hold. So there's almost like this violent act, if we can say that, of just the breaking of something in order, you know, breaking through the soil, breaking of the egg for the sperm to enter, or something like this on these basic like biological sort of, um, it's almost like attacking in order to break through, right? Something like that. Penetrating. Yeah, there you go. Uh huh. You can call it planting time or you can call it spring cleaning. I really liked that uh, with a tower card of just like taking that moment of just being like, oh, let's just get rid of all the old stuff like spring yep. clean, you know, plant new seeds, get rid of all the just like allow those moments to come through spring cleaning, which I really uh, resonated with like a uh, almost like a remediation way to work with the energy of the tower would be like going through stuff, spring cleaning, resetting. Yep, radical eviction of the old order, volcanic eruption of the seed at climax. There we go. Yep, there it is. So um, let's move. Do you guys have any more to say on like notes of Susan T. Chang or the tarot? Or do we want to sort of like move on to some other snips that we've accumulated? Um, I did want to just mention, because you spoke about it beautifully, what you were just saying that, you know, the emperor containing that symbol of uh, the Ankh also seems to be relevant to that sort of like penetrative force that creates new life. Um, and it, 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 it seems like a theme that's repeated in the two of wands too. So absolutely. And if the Ankh, and I'm, I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but if the Ankh is like this solar sort of like primordial like birth solar energy right again we have that sort of like choice of individuation or choice of representation of the whole like again that whole um that whole trajectory should i go for the bigger tricks do you guys want to start that section yeah let's do it let's do okay. it yeah so uh talking about what the bigger tricks has to say about aries one i'm going to read this first only paragraph and just mention that the color is red in another point of the book they mentioned so but in chapter 11 of book two uh it says the first face of Aries is Mars and there rises in it according to the opinion of the great sages in the science 
the image of a black man with a large and restless body, having red eyes and with a, an axe in his hand, girded with white cloth, and there is a great value in his face. This is a face of strength, high rank, and wealth without shame. This is its form. So when you have um, it saying wealth without shame, this is what I was mentioning earlier, like it will break through everything, it, that, that particular card that you guys were holding up in the other deck with the Roman soldier being rid of all his clothes, being in purple with all his you know, uh, privileges around him being shown. It's very comfortable, that emperor. And this is the energy. Like uh, you have a privilege that supports your entitlement. And this is an incredible, uh, incredibly propelling force uh, for any given individual to have. Like when you have privilege enough, but also the attitude to go after what you want in a relentless way, basically, or ruthless way even sometimes. Uh, that's the kind of energy we are talking about, seeing nothing but your goal, being very goal-oriented, in other words. And the wealth without shame is like, I, in order for my entitlement to work like this, I cannot think about how my resources come to me. I can only be, I can only embody the energy that I want to uh, exert uh, on the world around me. And I can only let it through. I cannot think about what's lacking or what's missing or what shouldn't or should be there. So wealth without, um, uh, without shame, that's a good, that's a face of strength, rank and wealth. So the rank part, like you see with a lot of Aries one people, they are generally people who are very, very important in their midst, be it because they are, and relevant, be it because they are um, the best at what they do, or just because they're the most charismatic, or because they had the right context, or because they had the right propaganda team that put them in that spot, and then they embodied the energy that they never had in their life before, but you know now they do because they had all the support for it. Uh, and we have some examples of a few people that we'd like to share with you guys. Like there's a list of names that we gathered, a few celebrities and uh, people who have that kind of shameless wealth um, and how they accumulated, like allegedly in some cases, we're going to touch very quickly on corruption here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, let's do so, it. Do you so, have the, the, the list of names there? I, I have it. I have it. I have it. And I just wanted to make like, I, first of all, I love everything that you said about the shame of wealth because it's like you know I'm not ashamed of conquering this land and everything I had the bloodshed I had to do to get there right I, I can it's just like I like what I like you know it's just like I only have the energy to go out and get it uh you know what I need my needs like my individuation like it's my land or your land I'd rather have it be mine or whatever you know it's just <laughs> that kind of like you can't think about anybody else or anything else besides this the red eyes only see everything through the margin perspective of its goal right of, there's of no goal. introspection or reflection that's a part of this. exactly none yeah, yeah right none. it's the <laughs> first decade of the first like ingress it's just like blah it's just like those most i guess even like animalistic like urges right just like completely unrefined unbridled you know, bang. So yeah, we do. And I cannot wait to tell you guys the first name, but I, what was the other thing? Oh yeah. I just thought it was interesting, interesting that they said with a restless body, mm -hmm. you know, it just like being just sort of like not being able to be still within your own self, not being able, like your restless body, you crave, you know, food or sex or like getting out there and getting the domination. I just, thought acting. Was, yeah. Another really interesting part of like not having shame in your wealth because you're just restless, just because you're restless, just because of that, you know, it's just like kind of, again, like a not well thought out, like reason to have a uh, shameless wealth or something. It's like a that. kind of energy that consumes, right? Uh, whatever is around it in order to, like the plant that's sprouting from the soil, it's also consuming the minerals around it in order to do so. It is converting energy from the soil itself in order to propel its own body forward. So, and that being uh, said, survival of the fittest, right? If you have seeds planted too close, it's up to this seed and that seed who's going to push the other one out, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, okay, so I think I'm very excited about this first name because you guys will see. So um, the first, oh, oh, I forgot my caveat. The caveat is not all of these are like 
amazingly rated charts. They're just sun in Aries one, right? So we're not talking, we were, David and I were looking for like sun in Aries one, like on the ascendant or sun, you know, on the 10th so that we could really look for the archetype, but it was late and we got tired. So we just took sun in, you know, sun Aries, in one. Aries one, just kind of- Especially like because the sun, again, the sun is what shines the primordial, you know, illuminating light on everything that gives life to everything. So if it, um, uh, if you're talking about the true form of the Deccans being manifest into the world, you're talking about the sun going over that Deccan and whatever comes forth through that on that time will have that influence of that sun manifesting that energy of the Deccan. However, you also got all the other planets and all of the other respective Deccans that they're in in your chart, and they are also going to play a factor in how you were formed. So you might see a few elements in some of these names that are not present in others. And you might see several people that you know in your life that are not, you know, bound, uh, boundlessly wealthy uh, and shamelessly wealthy uh, to enact their own will uh, into the world. But these celebrities, we want you to uh, to to look at with this eye. Mm, it is true that, for example, one of them. I'm not sure if you, you wanted to mention that I'm first. Gonna, but okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Can I say Lady Gaga? Yeah. <laughs> Lady Gaga. Okay, yeah. But it was, and Lady Gaga like is someone who definitely stands out in the background of pop stars from the past few decades. Uh, but I associate but, her with like relentlessness beyond compare. Totally. Relentless. I mean a meat dress? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? A meat dress? I mean, that was kind of her like first, you know, shock rock like thing. I mean, I'm sure there was a few more before that, but that was like her entrance on this stage of like shock rock, glam rock, like the meat dress, right? Yep. If that's not Aries one, we don't know what is. <laughs> and then on that note, um, this is my like shining example that I was so excited about uh, finding with David, Quentin Tarantino. Tarantino, a man with a, a mad man with an ax. <laughs> I mean, seriously, like just the way even in his movies, like sometimes they'll like spray blood like onto the screen of the viewer, right? Like you are, he's known for blood, especially bloody movies that you wouldn't even have to have, like he's Gratuitous. even criticized. Yeah, just like for fun, like extra, just for like all these in, in these almost, you know, dynamic ways of like, you wouldn't have had to show like all that or done that extra scene or right. did the extra like graphic squirting of blood like everywhere. <laughs> I mean, he's literally known for this cinematic way of shooting bloody scenes. Mm -hmm. And he's very unique as well. Like uh, it, 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 he's got a very unique distinguished style that everybody else is gonna use as a reference at some point, you know? uh everybody else that you know is inspired by him which is a lot of people and and what i also found just not off the top of just like okay blood and gore in his films but the topics that he chooses to write about are kind of toying with these ideas of like you know domination and subordination and you know revenge. like power revenge like race like you know what there was like the trigger warning uh, the Nazi film, I forgot the name of it. Glorious uh, Bastards. Uh, yes. Right, right. So just like taking on these like huge, absolutely intense topics and bringing about these characters that have like all of this color within it and all this like the violence of, of that reality, right? And the, right, the revenge of that reality yes. is just perfect. For Aries one, right? It's such a prime example. I was yeah. so I, wanna, I, I love that. And I wanted to give other examples too relating to Aries one that are about domination, starting with the president of Brazil currently. Uh, we have Bolsonaro being in Aries one. He's born in the first day of Aries, that little ram. Uh, he <laughs> is um he's something. And so not he's happy been, birthday. Not sorry? happy birthday, not happy birthday to him. <laughs> a, a very unpleasant birthday to him, I hope. Uh, but he is someone who's been accused of shamelessly throughout the past 30 years, acquiring wealth through illegal means. Of course, that's not being thoroughly investigated because all these people are on the case. So you, you can't really make um, things get through for him to get accused fully. Uh, his kids, on the other hand, can be accused and have been 
they've been trying to persecute to persecute them uh, for the past few years. And they just got themselves rich through politics, never did anything for the country, uh, keep deviating lots and lots of money. Those are accusations that are not proven because you know the proofs are not being accepted by the people that should accept them in order to start a case. But that's the only, only reason why. So it's shameless uh, wealth represented and domination. He's a very neo-fascist kind of figure and he'll do everything to uh, uphold his power position. Uh, anything. <laughs> so I mean, he's, that's a per that, honestly that's a perfect example because how do you challenge the emperor, right? Exactly. You're saying like and no how, one challenges. what facts? What facts do you? What have? facts? Yeah, I don't see it. And if I don't see it, and if I give you a new narrative for you to tell every other person that is questioning you that you don't see it too, here's the narrative. I have it. You know that globe, that little globe, like he's giving to his followers and being like, you can have this perspective, and no one will ever be able to topple you. Because it's like you're protected by all these factors and circumstance. You have all these. And it's just that energy of Aries that is disruptive. It's a tower moment for everyone in the country. And uh, it also in, in the economic blocks that Brazil is a part of and all of that. Like, yeah, our image is not good um, politically outside of Brazil right now. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just it. so this is one example that you can all see is it like a despotic kind of example that is very clear with the imagery of the emperor in the lower polarity side uh, yes. and if anyone wants to argue with that because you have different political views that's fine just don't do it to me because i don't care <laughs> uh, <laughs> or feel free i mean honestly feel free to comment down below i mean if you have different ideas about it and you know we want to spark conversation i mean hello yeah. lord of domination just don't be let's hateful fight, let's fight just about don't be it not <laughs> Yeah. I'm just kidding. I don't want to fight about it. What did you say, David? <laughs> yeah, just don't be hateful. Uh, that's and, and, and if you are, that's your problem. So whatever. <laughs> I don't care. probably delete hateful <laughs> or triggering comments, but we do a fiery dialogue is completely fine. But we're not meant we're not trying to make a political statement. You know, even if uh, this is a perfect example, the president of Brazil of this Aries one archetype. We know this to be positions in pa positions of power in general. So even, you know, I could say probably a lot of the same things about different leaders throughout the globe that have to do with this like domination thing, even if they don't have Sun and Aries one. He was just, we were just like, oh my God, it's a perfect example. Okay. And it is. So and I wonder if the ancient sources wouldn't depict some of these Aries imageries with uh, weapons like guns, because he's all, he's all for gun, uh, uh, like relaxation of gun regulation. Right, regulation, right? I don't know, here in Brazil. Uh, so, um, and he's made the life of gun, uh, like weapon trafficking, traffickers all over Brazil much easier this year. Oh, it absolutely uh, put artillery and gunfire, like fire. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think it would come into the same kind of scenario with absolutely. the axe thing. Absolutely, firearms. I mean, it's fire, it's like of your body right it's an arm of fire right and it's this explosive atom splitting moment with a firearm mm -hmm. so absolutely yeah. i think it, yeah absolutely all of that because you know what especially in all of these Aries deacons but in this first one because um once we get to scorpio we see mars in a very different way so this mars on mars like blah like fire like the time is now like that light masculine that uh home of mars right <laughs> And the lightning, right? I mean, lightning was the most closest thing that they had to like gunshots back then, yeah. I suppose, right? Yeah. So like gunfire is like thunder and lightning now, like in the, you know. In yes. The, yeah. You know? So, okay. And the, David, there was another Brazilian that I forgot to put on the list. Ayrton Senna. Ayrton Senna. He was a famous racer in the 90s. I think he died in 91 or 94. I don't remember. But uh, he was uh, the top racer here in Brazil, and we, he was a national treasure. <laughs> it would be like uh, the loss of Kobe Bryant for the people in the U.S. Uh, in previous years. Like it would have been R.O. Ayrton Senna, but Ayrton Senna is a popular figure to this day. Like we honor him. Like there are several institutes to his um, in his name and things like that. Like beneficent institutes and non governmental. Um, entities that try to help people and do all that like because he was into that kind of stuff I guess like he was someone who did that um, but he was also a national treasure and he was again very visible the symbol for a lot of people uh, of what a, a top 
you know, fame, top celebrity should be because he was like a, a, a he was like a Diana kind of personality, you know, a Lady Diana kind of personality. Everyone, everywhere he went, people loved him. He was praised. He was awarded, and he was just a, a wonderful human being in everyone's eyes. In that Would sense, you so say it that can with all the foundations and things he had that he had some sort of empire of publicity. Well, definitely. Like he is, uh, when you are that person and embodies a certain type, a, a certain archetype. Uh, and you become the imagery of that for a lot of people, um, you kind of are the emperor of that particular archetype. You embody the emperor energy because you are that archetype being upheld for other people to see you as if it were it. Well, what I really love as the juxtaposition of this example is in this case, he's a beloved emperor. He still does this like thing, but he's known to the people and wanted to be remembered because he represented some type of a Aries archetype that people actually did respect, which is a lot different than the domination style of the last example, you know? So yes, exactly. So I really love that, right? Like I really love that there's some action there. What type of eraser was he? Was it cars? Um, yeah, like the Formula One. I'm not sure if that's okay. how you call it. But. I mean, to me, that's, again, that's like such a perfect example, like trying to go as fast as you can, as quick as you can, better than everybody else. <laughs> you know? Like, yes. that's probably the best. That's very Aries one. Yes, it's probably the best and safest way to embark on these energies that we've talked about so far would be someone starting at a finish line revving it up trying to beat the others in a way that's uh has a positive outcome for people to sort of emulate as far as like being an athlete or a, a, a high achiever let's say instead of like in being beloved by the people instead of trying to dominate the people with that sort of like fast hot quick me first um energy so love that. And then I'm going to go through um, just, I think I'm just going to go through bullet points, a few people, and then we'll just kind of like talk about them if, 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 if you guys feel like it, if it comes up. So then we've got Elton John, which is a really cool Aries archetype. Um, Big Sean, maybe not a lot of people would know him. He's not super famous outside of the U.S., but his main, you can look him up because his main song, it's old, it's maybe 10 years old or something like this. But it's so like, uh, I don't want to say violent, but it, it's very, listen to uh, Big Sean, I Don't Blank With You. And it's just kind of like, doesn't really have these big points or whatever. It's just kind of like being aggressive for like no real, you know, with no real point. Like the chorus goes on and on about like how I don't F with you and he's like insulting this other person. And that's literally the chorus of the song. So when David found him, I was like, I think that, I think that works. Um, then of course, Lady Gaga, who we talked about. Um, Diana Ross. So coming with that big vocal energy, right? Being able to be heard and like, sh I feel like when I think of an Aries one person too, it's like being able to have your voice right and really that I feel like she embodies that so strong I, I think yeah. iconic is a good word for this decade mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and absolutely like she's the icon and then uh again with the voice so we're gonna keep going with this voice thing we've got Mariah Carey who is like known for her voice and hitting these high notes that are just like nobody else can hit right like yeah. she's just and I love that one of her most like famous songs because of her beef with Eminem, which is a rapper, um, is like is like obsessed. Why why are you so obsessed with me? You know, like, <laughs> right? like that's kind of her meme, like what she's known for now is like you're obsessed so, with me, like and being the queen of or, or the one where she's like, oh, I don't know who that is. Right. <laughs> I don't know her. I don't know her. And if I don't know her, she doesn't exist in the sphere of the world. <laughs> that's it that's two of wands that's this it's just like who what where it's mine right you know like like that kind of like wealth without what is it wealth without um shame it's just kind of like well, oh, why are you so well. obsessed with me you know? it's just like so classic double mars um 
so then we've got Aretha Franklin, who, and obviously these charts have, you know, all the other planets affecting them and the houses affecting them. So you're going to see real different characteristics. But I thought, but again, was icon. Freaking, again <laughs> mm -hmm. freaking icon for this voice, this deep, and, you know, she spoke out against like a lot of things and put a lot of beautiful, um, uh, deep and complex things into her music, which is why their topics, I should say, not just things, but like these kind of like really lamentating topics and, and use her voice to bring those through. And I felt like this was a really, yes, iconic, but also a really deep um, character to bring through for this, for finding her voice. Whereas Mariah Carey, not to say she's not deep, just pop star vibes, right? Where you got Aretha Franklin, who's like really going in there. Um, and again, on the deep note, Vincent Van Gogh. Yep. And I just know that red hair thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. The red hair and Celine Dion. And then we've got Nancy Pelosi, who's known for fighting, like fighting, right? <laughs> Two right. Else. Just fighting against or fighting for or whatever it is. She's a U.S. politician. Um, Dane Rudyard, who, does anyone want to talk a little bit about Dane Rudyard? He's an astrologer, so um, take it away. He was one of the father of the moderns. That's the way that I yeah, he was. would put it. <laughs> yeah, like he was someone who interpreted a lot of the material for modern astrology to, you know, in, in a concise way for modern astrology to be. In like the 1930s. The way it is today, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, and he was really hip to like this psychological kind of like Freudian vibes. And he was definitely, I think, really a respected astrologer even now to this time, like even within like the modern movement, um, a lot of like ancient astrologers uh, respecting Rigier's work, like just for the archetypal kind of like classic work that he did. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, in my mind, Katie, that's exactly how I think of him is like the father of, which is interesting, the father, the emperor of like hey, this modern yeah. astrological wave, this modern astrological movement. Yes. Um, yeah. So an astrologer here. And I think he did have sort of a brash uh, viewpoint and vibe as well. And then um, really cool kind of added little magical ending for the list is Houdini. Which is interesting as far as domination goes because you're almost dominating someone's thought when you're doing illusion magic, right? Like you're the one telling people what to see and how to see it and, but to create that illusion. Yes, you know? the, the master, the puppet master behind the scenes sort of situation with the smoke and mirrors, that's, yeah. I like that many of his tricks are about like escaping. I think he died in one of them, uh, like in a in a safe in the water. He drowned or something. Uh, and so, yeah, he he came out of places. <laughs> he was known for his. Um, and I don't know that much about Houdini, but I know about Houdini through. Oh God, why am I going to forget his name now? The epic, awesome modern magician that Blank. does all the this angel. Yes, oh, David okay. Blaine, right? <laughs> and by watching David Blaine stuff, he talks about like Houdini being an escape artist and um, uh, inspiring him or whatever. But just the idea of the danger, right? Like yes. uh, putting yourself in such extreme danger to the point of situations, yeah. 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 It's almost. Yeah. And again, Houdini is an icon for his um, field. Yeah. Yes. I mean, he's the, you know, top dog or whatever. Houdini uh, is now like synonymous with somebody who can get out of anything. Like he's definitely made it beyond the bounds of magicianship. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> or beyond the bounds of illusion magic and into the world of yeah. magic. You kind of have a Regina George <laughs> vibe with him, like a trendsetter, <laughs> kind of mean girl. Not with yeah. Houdini, but with the, the first decade of Aries. We, we uh, should have found some fictional characters that we think have Aries 1 <laughs> vibes. That would be so fun. Oh, Regina George, Aries 1 for life. I mean, she, she dealt with her, um, like, mental health issues by fighting, like, by, by going into fighting with other people other or wrestling people. And, or something like that. It was... Oh, my God. Really we should have... That's one thing that I, you know, just the famous you know, obvious like boxers and fighters that uh, we always look at their charts, but it would be interesting to look at that. Maybe I'll bring something forward if there's something of use in um, Aries 2 or Aries 3, or we can kind of review it again um, if we find someone, but it would be very interesting to look at like 
athletic fighters, right? Yeah. Or, you know, professional fighters as far as that explosive energy. I'm sure it would make for a very mm -hmm. amazing cage fighter. Yeah. So, yeah, but well, are those the names that we have? Yeah, that's it. And yeah. well, I wanted to ask you two, do you have any special planets or points in your chart in Aries one? Good question. Don't. I no. do not. My IC. Hmm. <laughs> interesting <laughs> how do you do you find any kind of like a do you do you find any kind of like impulse within the wait what what house is it or maybe you don't have to say but how do you find that how do you um it's it's in my fifth house and um i think um i think i had a lot of anger when i was a kid and i was very uh yeah i was very hot-headed and very quick to anger and quick to throw a tantrum so the dominion of children, right? The dominion of like, right, just being a bratty kid. So yeah, that was me. <laughs> tantrums are perfect for this. I mean, tantrums, that's literally descriptive of this, like no foresight thing. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I've, I'm co-parent to three uh, nieces and nephews. And when they're little, it's like they could snap. You don't even know what they're snapping. Exactly. Like two <laughs> seconds. And it's just this big, long drawn out like violent explosion and it's like they're taken over yep they're completely taken over by some force some martial yeah. <laughs> some martial force and um they kind of emerge after and you can feel that right with the quickening of the blood or like with a, a race an impending race that's coming you can feel your blood quicken your heart race and and I don't know about you guys, but if you've ever had a fit of anger yourself, yes. <laughs> it does sort of like wash your David's like, not me. <laughs> not me. <laughs> All right, Capricorn Mars, fine. <laughs> I'm peaceful. I'm, a, I'm peaceful. He's got a controlled Mars. He's exalted. <laughs> um, but I, only but use it in times of need. <laughs> yeah, with precision. With precision. A sharp and precise tongue. Yeah, but yeah. yeah the, the, the fury of Mars that washes over you, right? This card like, is so Capricorn, Capricorn Mars. You think? Yeah. yeah. It's the careful plotting and like planning mm -hmm. and the, the, the before action, getting all your ideas together, you know? To me, at least. Sorry, I got excited. <laughs> no, I can see that. A more strategic, um, like, uh, what do you want to say? The wrath of, what do you want to? I can't think of the term when you like write fight, like you only, you save your, you know, language and emotion of, for like a precise, uh, calculated situation. Yes. Like you don't just let anyone have your anger or whatever. I, uh, one of my gurus says something like, I won't give anybody that pleasure to, for them to have the martial wand that makes me triggered to anger no one won't no one will see that you right. know it won't come towards you because i have this sort of you know more of a capricornian uh marshal for those of you who are watching when mars is exalted mars takes its exaltation where it's sort of like highest uh rank or achievement in the sign of capricorn so that's what we're talking about and capricorn being a little bit more cold calculated concise um instead of just like this flushing of the face you know this ruddy like in your blood in your skin uh madness that anger can just wash over you it's a little bit more uh mature or you have safe outlets for your anger in other words you can transmute that energy into uh other things that are more practically useful well one would hope we'll see we'll see when we get there one would one would learn <laughs> time. Yeah, one would learn and yeah. experience and headbutting from experience yeah yeah. And headbutting, right? Like, I think that's a, the word that we haven't used yet for Aries one, but uh, Susan Chang says it in her book too, something like you would get this impression that if the ram wouldn't have someone or something to ram into, it would just ram its head into a tree just because yeah. it needed to like get that energy out. Again, a tantrum, a fit. It's just like, you see red, like you just have to vent it. You just have to do something with that energy like right now because it just, it just streams over you, right? Yeah, so then I wanted to just let everybody know, I don't know how we're gonna edit it into this specific video, but we have a friend, D from- From Sun Child Tarot. Yes, and he um, specializes in tarot. He also specializes in, what is it? The Goetic 
uh, demons. Yeah, the Goetia. The Goetia, that's right. And so we've asked him to submit like a little video. So we might do like a deep dive with D and um, he'll either be spliced into these videos throughout or we'll do like a secondary commentary on what he walks us through. He did a 13 minute video uh, for this one and it, it was really good. I watched it this morning. I wasn't able to send it to you guys yet, but it's so good. So definitely check that out. We'll probably end up splicing those into these actual videos or maybe doing them as secondary videos. We'll see what the vibe is. So definitely um, stay tuned for stay that. Stay tuned. Yeah, yeah, stay tuned for that because he's submitting one for every um, deck in as well. And then drop an ax. Uh, drop an axe in the comments below and y'all's contacts and offerings like do we want to just say it one more time explicitly like where they can find you david oh my uh, website is in the first place astrology.com uh and my instagram is the same handle in the first place astrology you can also perhaps find me as david fisher in those uh social media platforms uh, and instagram and facebook uh, as well as in the first place I offer tutoring sessions for beginner astrologers who want to get accustomed to techniques that they might have learned on the online courses that we have out there. Uh, I have practical examples. I can use your chart. I can use your family's chart and we can arrange um, the best way for you to get through your learning. And I also offer private consultations with astrology. The offerings are in my um, website and tarot. And also just to let you guys know, we have just our basic contact in the about section of the Hellenistic astrology as well. So if you missed any of that or whatever, definitely David's uh, just basic email is over there. So go ahead and uh, find it there in the first place with David Fisher. And David, would you mind saying like, do you have any, so David's a very proficient astrologer. Uh, he's a primarily Hellenistic astrologer, but he's versed in Vedic, I know, because both of him and I like to play with it, as well as like some of the medieval techniques as well. Um, but Hellenistic primarily. Is there any particular things that you would love to tutor people on? I know you're really uh, into zodiacal releasing, which is kind of a hot and considered to be like one of the more harder timing techniques or like kind of complex. So you tutor people in zodiacal releasing, don't you? Yeah, so that releasing, perfections, um, even distributions through the bounds, things that you want to use for general timing and uh, funneling down the experiences that someone might have in any particular time. Yeah, so I just and wanted when to, to look that. out for certain activations. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that because of the fact that like, definitely um, David offers tutoring, I do. I'm not sure if Katie does on the basics of Hellenistic astrology, but you know, you wouldn't have to be a beginner astrologer to get tutoring because David tutors into some of the harder, yeah, again, like through the bounds that I could release saying. So I, I guess intermediate or even advanced astrologers uh, could contact him for, uh, you know, little one-on-ones to get the techniques into their bones a little bit more. And then um, Katie. Yeah, so um, I have, my website's on kddayton.com. Um, and I'm also at that handle on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, not super active on Instagram, but uh, why not? Um, I offer both astrology and tarot readings. Um, I do offer combo of those, especially for solar returns. That's one of my favorite things to do is solar return charts for people. Um, I think it's a great idea to get your reading done once a year and kind of plan your year ahead. Um, and I do have a currently inactive newsletter that I'm going to start up again soon um, that has to do with the lunar phases, uh, the cycles of the moon throughout the year and cooking recipes and seasonal associations with, with that. Um, I don't do tutoring at this time, but um, I do really enjoy when I have, uh, and it will take extra time when I have students of astrology uh, book readings with me to talk a little bit about the techniques, the theories, and the um, uh, yeah, the techniques that I'm using during the reading. So I'm happy to have people uh, come reach out to chat. Um, my email address is on my website and uh, I look forward to hearing from folks. And your email address is also in the about section of this channel. So go ahead and head over there as well if you need that um, website. And maybe we'll comment some of the things in the comments below too, just so you can have easy access to our stuff. Um, this Hellenistic astrology channel is just budding. So um, we are on Instagram. Again, it's not active and up and running, but definitely follow over there because I'm going to be doing some lives. I have some important 
stuff I'd like to share. And I think we'll be going live more often over there. Um, I haven't activated anything on Facebook for this channel yet. So follow us here on YouTube, go to Instagram. And then as far as Elsa Wadsworth, me, I do tutoring like for your basic Hellenistic astrology stuff. Like if you're using Chris's book or taking Chris Brennan's book or taking Chris Brennan's course, or, you know, a lot of us, uh, found each other through nightlight astrology, our teacher Achuta Bhava Das. So, and so Achuta students, if you guys need help with your test, like preparing before your test. Anyways, I do tutoring on that level. And as far as readings, I am open for readings selectively. The, they do fill up, but I am open. Um, I do also love to do the solar return mix with annual perfection for like a year ahead thing. Um, that can also be broken down into months. So you can kind of look at your months ahead which ones are better or worse I love doing electional astrology I love doing like uh basic kind of remediation magic with people too so like if you want to build out a ceremony or if you want to look at how you can care or feed you know your planetary stuff if you also again like Katie said if you're a student already but you just want to like pontificate about your chart and ask an astrologer like different things about your personal chart. I'm open for that as well. Instead of doing just like a classic, you know, reading, if you want to come in and have specific questions about your chart, I'm open for that as well. So yeah, a bunch of readings. Oh yeah, the website. Um, my website isn't up yet, soon to come. You know, I'll get a mic and kind of like build out the studio a little better, but I hope you could hear us good today. We're just kind of, you know, on our basic uh you know launching point so things should start to move through you'll have more places to follow us so thanks guys so much for uh sharing your wisdom it's so fun to get together with you guys um and for sharing yeah, this is fun. Else. yeah it's really great so katie do you want to um yeah so um you know well wishes to everyone thanks again so much like and subscribe and do you want to carry us out with that poem yes absolutely cool. so um at the end of every single one of her chapters um chang includes a poem associated with the deccan and this one that she includes for aries one is called the hand that signed the paper by dylan thomas the hand that signed the paper felled a city five sovereign fingers taxed the breath doubled the globe of dead and halved a country. These five kings did a king to death. The mighty hand leads to a sloping shoulder. The finger joints are cramped with chalk. A goose's quill has put an end to murder that put an end to talk. The hand that signed the treaty bred a fever and famine grew and locusts came. Great is the hand that holds dominion over man by a scribbled name. The five kings count the dead, but do not soften the crusted wound nor pat the brow. A hand rules pity as a hand rules heaven. Hands have no tears to flow. And with that, thanks so much. Signing off. See you in 10 days or less. Ciao. Bye.